Thanks for joining us for CBN Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. The gun debate is now front and center on Capitol Hill following the Las Vegas shooting. Lawmakers' primary focus is new legislation that would ban a gun accessory. CBN's Jenna Browder is on the story. She's reporting now from Washington. The gun control stalemate in Washington could be near an end, at least on one issue, as Republicans and Democrats appear to agree on legislation that would ban bump stocks. The gun accessory used by the Las Vegas shooter allows a semi-automatic weapon to fire continuously like an automatic. Get down. Get down. Right now, they're legal and only cost about $100. The goal is to prohibit uh, these deadly devices that caused so much death and destruction in Las Vegas earlier this week. Republican Representative Carlos Curbelo says he will introduce a bipartisan bill in the House to put a total ban on bump stocks, similar to a bill proposed by Democrats in the Senate. We have to act now, and we're not going away. We've told the families. We have to pass something. But not all lawmakers are on board, like Representative Steve Scalise, who was shot and nearly killed at a Republican baseball practice in June. He's concerned that a ban on bump stocks would lead to wider regulations on guns. Senator John Kennedy agrees. I, I don't think that uh, the 80 or 90 million Americans who exercise their Second Amendment rights to uh, to own a gun should be punished for the act of one evil person. As for the president, we'll be looking into that over the next short period. So for now, the future remains in the hands of Congress. Meantime, the Department of Homeland Security has reached out to police departments, warning them of possible copycats. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Prayers continue now for the more than 100 people still recovering from Sunday's gun violence in Las Vegas. CBN contrib contributor Stephanie Riggs has the latest now from that city. The motive behind the largest mass shooting in U.S. history remains a mystery, but police say it was most definitely premeditated. And the shooter may have even planned his escape. They say the note they found in his room was not a suicide note. Although Stephen Paddock shot and killed himself, it sounds like he planned to survive. He had 1,600 rounds of ammunition in his car, including fertilizer that could have been used to make explosives, and 60 pounds of tannerite used in explosive rifle targets. Investigators are looking into whether Paddock scoped out bigger music festivals here in Las Vegas and in Chicago before deciding on the 32nd floor of Mandalay Bay and 22,000 unsuspecting souls, killing 58 of them and injuring just under 500. Paddock had rented rooms overlooking the Life is Beautiful show in late September near the Strip here in Vegas and the heavily attended Lollapalooza Festival in Chicago in August. It's still not clear if he aborted his plans to carry out those attacks. Investigators have put together a profile of a disturbed and dangerous man who had been compiling an arsenal for decades. The coroner will not release his autopsy, but behavioral experts wonder if the 64-year-old suffered from a brain abnormality or had a terminal illness that led him to lose his mind and do the unthinkable. As some victims still fight for their lives in Las Vegas area hospitals, people gather outside of Mandalay Bay, fill Las Vegas blood banks and churches offering support. My heart is warmed by the many people that are coming together right now, even at this church. I mean, it's just amazing. And how do you feel about the gunman? I don't think it's his fault. I, I, I don't think it's his fault. He, he, he's, he's not right. He's, it wasn't God. It wasn't, it wasn't him. It, it, was an, an, it was another thing. It was an evil thing. It, he's, I, I forgive him. Las Vegas is often referred to as Sin City, but some locals are renaming it Sincere City or Grace City, revealing a side of this place we have not seen before. In Las Vegas, Stephanie Riggs, CBN News. 
Unusually heavy rain drenches Central America, causing dozens of deaths. We've seen an increase of 25 to 50 percent more rain in September and October this year. 32 people have died in Honduras and 26 in Guatemala. More than 300,000 Guatemalans are affected by the rising water, which is damaging homes, roads and bridges. Costa Rica, Nicaragua, El Salvador and Panama are also affected. Churches are praying for the rain to stop and God's protection on the people. One group has held a special prayer on Facebook. Still to come here on CBN News Watch, the major demographic shift that's shaking up churches across the country. Find out how churches are adapting to this new Latino Reformation. The Trump administration is moving forward with changes to the immigration policy. First, the Department of Homeland Security has stopped accepting renewals for the immigrant work program known as DACA. The Trump administration will be implementing new immigration policies. Those policies would include a proposed legislation that would dramatically reduce legal immigration rates. Extended family members would no longer be able to join permanent residents under the green card system. The White House is also expected to endorse a plan that would allow states to write their own immigration legislation. This year, the world is making, marking the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. It began 500 years ago, and there's talk of a new major movement in the church underway right now. As Heather Sells reports, some Hispanic leaders call it the Latino Reformation. On any given Sunday at the Crossing Church in Tampa, you'll see a mix of ages, backgrounds, and races. In Florida, almost a quarter of the population is Hispanic, so churches here are already benefiting from their involvement and leadership. Since 2013, the Latino population has just exploded around here, and we, we're seeing it. Two of our main worship pastors are Latino. They're amazing, and they bring kind of the salsa flair, the fire, if you will. Um, our student pastor and our campus pastor in South Shore are both Latino. As part of this new generation of Hispanic leadership, senior pastor Greg Dumas fits a growing trend. He doesn't speak Spanish and barely identifies himself as Hispanic. I'm, I'm, I'm Latino, kind of. <laughs> Still, Dumas is well aware of his congregation's diversity. We almost exactly represent Tampa. When you talk about African-American, white, Latino. The crossing is right on cue with a Latino population surge reshaping not just the country, but our churches. By 2050, one in three Americans will be Latino. Combine that with phenomenal church growth across Latin America and add Pope Francis, and you get a modern day Latino reformation. Authors Robert Crosby and Samuel Rodriguez make that case in their new book, When Faith Catches Fire. There's the idea or the perception in white evangelicalism and even in the African-American church, the Latinos are this emerging immigrant group. Misnomer, we emerged. We are not emerging. We emerged. We're here. And, and we're here in, in viable leadership roles. Rodriguez says the rise of Latino Christians in the U.S. is no coincidence. He believes they may not only bless the church here, they can help redeem it in a culture that openly attacks biblical views. When you have a white evangelical advocating for this, God bless them, it's one thing. But when you have a Latino advocating, the moment you come against that Latino, you're coming against an ethnicity and a minority. It serves as a firewall against the assault. Crosby warns church leaders about the consequences if they ignore this key demographic. To me, uh, churches that choose not to become multi-ethnic are losing and will lose. The strongest presence and growth that we've experienced has come from the Latin community. River of Life Church is also attracting Latinos from all backgrounds, but it hasn't always been that way. The area was predominantly white when the church first opened its doors. As Hispanics arrived, the church adapted. We've tried to be intentional in representing our community um, and those on the platform and then those that are uh, working with people. Crosby and Rodriguez say churches that welcome Latinos tend to become, quote, salsified, not only passionate in their faith, but pursuing salvation and social justice. The vast majority of evangelical churches in America in the next 20 years will be both vertical and horizontal churches, will be both Billy Graham and Dr. King. Latinos are doing that mm -hmm. because we're not either or, we're both and. Mm -hmm. 
So it will be a very healthy church committed to righteousness, but likewise committed to biblical justice in the name of Jesus. You open your heart to Latinos in your community and you will bless your church because you'll be bringing in people that not only want to get right with God, but they're very concerned about their neighbors, their communities. Pastors told us Latinos have made their congregations more focused on the Holy Spirit and emphasize that church is family. And they're not just serving, they're leading with a holistic vision of ministry at a time when the church needs it. But I think white evangelicals still look at the Latino church as a minority church that's looking for this, and we're not looking for a handout. We're actually looking for this, kingdom collaboration. Collaboration that could revitalize the church in this country. Reporting in Tampa, Heather Sells, CBN News. It warns of the dangers of the Islamic State, but the story hasn't been labeled as hate speech. Find out why YouTube has banned this CBN News story. Next. Welcome back. YouTube has removed a CBN News story label labeling it as hate speech. CBN News reporter Dale Hurd traveled to Paris in 2014 to report on the Islamic State. He warned of the danger of jihadists returning to Europe to launch terror attacks. YouTube has called the report hate speech and removed it from its site. Here's the story. This is a message to the brothers who stayed behind. These are British jihadists in Syria, trying to recruit more Muslim young men to come and join them. They've taken to social media to share an Islamic message with their friends back home. Even if you've led a sinful life, the Quran teaches that martyrdom is a ticket to heaven. Dear brothers, especially brothers and also sisters, in the land of jihad at the moment, with a Glock 19, yeah? Most of you Playboy guys ain't seen this yet. What we've come to do here is what's prescribed to us as Muslim men. But I also invite you all over to the land of Jihad. Grizzly Instagram photos and videos sent out to friends back home include bags and even truckloads of severed heads. Someday these jihadists will go home. Some already have. Mehdi Namouche, the French gunman who killed four people at the Jewish Museum in Brussels in May, was arrested carrying a homemade flag of ISIS, the terrorists who have set up an Islamic State in Iraq. Mehdi Namouche went to fight in Syria in 2012. The French government knows it has a big problem on its hands. Hundreds of Muslim radicals who went to Syria to fight in the civil war and are bringing jihad back to Europe. More than 700 Frenchmen and as many as 3,000 Europeans are believed to have fought or are now fighting in Syria and Iraq. They are young men who did not, in their eyes, go bad. They believe they found religion. And when they're not killing people, they're handing out Qurans and helping establish a worldwide Islamic state. The mother of one of the jihadists talked to Britain's Sky News. Absolutely shocked to see how his character has changed. He's a, he's a lovely boy for any mother could ever have and want. He's honest, always caring for his family, always want to be there for them. And he's just one of those best boys any mother could ever want. This Dutch jihadist in Syria talking to a reporter via Skype thought it was amusing that the British government, by helping Islamic rebels in Syria, was helping jihad. It's funny. I mean, the British government itself is funding and training, be it in Jordan or wherever here in Syria, uh, the Free Syrian Army. So basically, the, the British government is helping, and I'm helping in my way. Helping to bring an Islamic caliphate. So far, eight European nations have agreed to exchange information about the European jihadists in the hope of tracking them and possibly arresting them when they return. Strong enforcement is needed because there are many more Mehdi Namushas who want to attack in Europe. It's almost inevitable that having joined an organization like ISIS, for example, that uh, is even too extreme for Al-Qaeda, um, that these individuals will at some stage be sent back to Europe, to Britain, uh, and expected to conduct terrorist attacks here. French officials just uncovered a plot by Muslim radicals to blow up the Eiffel Tower 
and take down airliners. The former head of France's National Jewish Association says, unfortunately, it's a mathematical certainty that more European Jews will die at the hands of Muslim radicals. It is mathematical because uh, the, to cross the border is very simple. To buy a Kalashnikov, it's nothing. But the motivation is so strong. And the motivation is extremely strong. Europe's failed experiment in multiculturalism could suddenly become very dangerous for everyone when the war in the Middle East is over and Europe's jihadists all go home. Dale Hurd, CBN News, Paris. And there's more of CBN News. Watch straight ahead. Stay with us. This is someone's home, and you never disrespect that, even when it's yours. I left because I thought it'd be better for the family. I did what I thought was best. You don't have a clue what happened. This place destroyed my childhood. I didn't disappear. I just didn't want to become him. That was a clip from the film Generational Sins, a movie heading to theaters October 6th. The team behind the movie say it's part of a new genre called hard faith films. And joining me now is writer and director Spencer Fulmer and Thurman Mason, who is the executive producer of Generational, film, Generational Sins. First, hard faith. What does that mean? We are familiar, I'm assuming, with the traditional faith-based films. And I think that often faith-based films have been synonymous with family-friendly films. And what we're looking at with hard faith films is that we want to explicitly talk about our greatest truth, which is Jesus Christ and the gospel. And we want to do it in a way that's more of like an adult Bible study. Are you concerned harder elements might turn some, though, away? Traditional faith-based movies, for the most part, have been made by Christians exclusively for Christian consumption. And while there's nothing wrong for that, and there's certainly a space for that, uh, those films are not reaching the unchurched. Many would say, why create a new category to categorize the film and not just create a good film? You know, in our film, Generational Sins, when you get to watch it in theaters or on online, you know, we are not abashed whatsoever about Jesus Christ. Like, it's not a good feeling inside of you. It's not... Um, anything else but the gospel and whenever the re reason why we we have created this genre is because whenever we send our film to one of the main distributors as soon as they hear anything about jesus or see a cross they send it to their faith-based department whenever the faith-based department hears any colorful language or more adult themes they try and send it back to their secular mainstream distributor mm. and so that's really that's a bad space for christian artists because um, there's, a, there's a lot of different stories that can be told in this new realm of hard faith films. Now, some Christian film critics have said that hard faith is not a new genre. Uh, so what do you say to that, Spencer? There is a unique expression maybe in a younger generation. Maybe there's a unique expression for millennials or people that weren't raised in the church. And I think, you know, you can either fall on either side of the, the argument as far as Either you censor Jesus or you censor the world. And we don't want it to do either. And I, and I don't know that you could really put any other film in that category because we're not censoring the film for the left or the right, whatever that it may be to you. All right, Spencer Fulmer, thank you so much for your time. We lost Thurman during that interview. We appreciate you both weighing in today. Much appreciated. And with that now, let's turn to your family-friendly movie review of what's new at the box office this weekend, The Mountain Between Us, from our friends at Plugged In Online.
In the movie The Mountain Between Us, a winter storm in Salt Lake City results in a number of flight cancellations. I think we may have the same problem. I have an idea. But two passengers, Alex and Ben, put their heads together to try to figure out how to reach their mutually important destinations. Alex needs to get to Denver for her wedding, and Ben is a neurosurgeon who must get to New York City to operate on a 10-year-old boy. So these complete strangers make arrangements to hire a small charter plane that can hopefully get them where they need to be. The trouble is, the pilot doesn't file a flight plan or tell anyone where he's going. And worse, while flying over the Rockies, he has a massive stroke and crashes the plane on a snowy mountain peak. So what now? Do Alex and Ben stick around and hope for rescue? Oh! Anybody? Anyone? Or do they embark on a perilous journey across many miles of frozen mountain wilderness? Nobody knows where we are. We're all we've got, me and you. This adventure slash romance film is a taut mountain trek that stresses elements of bravery and teamwork. On the other hand, this pick drags viewers through a couple of violent situations and hits them with lots and lots of harsh, profane language. And the central character's romance gets pretty steamy, especially considering this is a frozen setting. So I'm giving the mountain between us just two rocky outcroppings out of five for family friendliness. For an in-depth review of this movie or anything else at your local box office, visit us at PluggedIn.com. Plugging you into the movies, I'm Bob Olszewski for Focus on the Family's Plugged In Movie Review. Students across the U.S. participated in Bring Your Bible to School Day. Here's a look at some of the pictures you sent us. What a beautiful sight to see our children bringing the Word of God to school. Well, right now it is time for your Friday Faithful, and today I hope you will prayerfully consider this thought as we wrap the week and head into the weekend. I remember it from my childhood, hearing it on the radio very often. God is alive and well, and His Word will work for you. Embrace His Word knowing that it is alive and full of power, and you should be living it. Make this a fabulous Friday. That is a wrap for this edition of CBN Newswatch. Thank you so much for watching. Hope you'll join us right here next time. Make it a fabulous Friday and a wonderful weekend. We'll see you come Monday.